Hello, my name is Morgan Lima. I am a registered nurse and I've partnered with Picmonic to bring you all a three-part video series on the topic of HIV. You can find me on Instagram at The Teachable Nurse as well as at www.theteachablenurse.com. Today we're going to be learning about the human immunodeficiency virus or HIV. This is a three-part video series, and this first video is going to go into the history of HIV, as well as the life cycle of the virus. We're going to look at HIV and how it affects the body's immune system on a cellular level, and in later videos, we'll find out how medications can stop HIV in its tracks. So first, let's talk about HIV and what that acronym stands for. The terms HIV and AIDS are sometimes mistakenly used interchangeably, and this is a mistake because HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus, which, when left untreated, can turn into Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, also known as AIDS. Someone could have HIV their entire life and it never turn into AIDS. Even if HIV does progress to AIDS, people can take certain medications, which we'll discuss in depth in a later video, to control the virus and strengthen their immune system to the point where they no longer meet the diagnostic criteria for AIDS. HIV is the virus that causes AIDS. However, if the virus is identified early enough, the patient can take certain medications called antiretrovirals to decrease the viral load or amount of virus that lives in the patient's bloodstream to the point where it will not progress to AIDS. If a person is unable to suppress their virus, then the virus will continue replicating, weakening that person's immune system, and eventually leading to immunosuppression or opportunistic infections, both of which are AIDS-defining characteristics. The history of HIV and how it became an epidemic was widely debated for years due to fear and stigma. It is now known that HIV mutated from the simian immunodeficiency virus, or SIV. SIV was a virus common in chimpanzees in Central Africa, and HIV came from a type of chimpanzee in Central Africa that was infected with SIV, and it was most likely passed to humans through that type of chimpanzee's blood. And when the virus came in contact with human DNA, it mutated, going from SIV to HIV. Now, there are two types of HIV viruses. There's HIV-1 and HIV-2. For the purposes of this video series, we will be discussing HIV-1, as this is the type most commonly seen in our patient populations that you'll probably be seeing, and it's what we mean when we're discussing HIV in general, when I'm talking about the medications we're using to treat HIV. So let's take a moment to take a brief look at the timeline of the epidemiology of HIV. In 1983, this was the year that HIV-1 was first discovered, although a lot of people had been dying from and exhibiting symptoms of AIDS since 1980. It took two years and a lot of work from advocacy groups to form the International Network at the first International AIDS Conference in 1985. By 1986, three years after the virus had been identified, the WHO published a global AIDS strategy. In 1987, four years after the virus was identified, the first FDA-approved treatment for HIV, known as AZT, became available. However, this treatment is rarely used today due to side effects, as well as the fact that there are just better treatments out there, and we no longer use what's called monotherapy to treat the virus. However, at the time, AZT was the only life-saving or life-preserving treatment they had and therefore was widely used. In 1995, doctors began using combination therapy, meaning rather than just one class of drug used for treatment, drugs from different classes were utilized to prevent treatment failure. So how does HIV spread from human to human? We know that HIV can be transmitted six ways. So blood, semen, preseminal fluids, vaginal fluids, rectal fluids, and breast milk. There are three stages of HIV infection. 
Once someone is infected with HIV, they have entered the acute stage or stage one. In this stage, someone has just acquired the virus due to an exposure from one of the six ways we just discussed. The person may experience fever, chills, muscle aches, and fatigue, and they may think they have the flu. The HIV viral load, or number of copies of the virus in the bloodstream, is extremely high in this stage because it's rapidly replicating. Patients may present to the emergency room or their primary care doctor thinking they have a bug or the flu, at which point they could be given an antigen antibody test or a nucleic acid test. And these tests are the valid confirmatory HIV blood tests. And I'll go into detail a little more about that later. During stage two, or chronic infection stage of HIV infection, the patient has been prescribed appropriate medication and the viral load has decreased in the bloodstream to the point at which it is undetectable with blood tests. It's important to note though that although the viral load is undetectable in this stage, the patient is not cured from the virus. However, If the patient continues taking their prescribed medication, they will be asymptomatic and continue to live a long and healthy life. However, if these patients do not take their HIV medication, the chronic stage or stage two will progress to stage three and therefore they will be able to pass on HIV to others. If they continue taking their medications, they will remain in this stage for the rest of their lives. If the infection progresses to stage three, then that person has been diagnosed with acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, or like we discussed before, AIDS. This stage can either end in death or it can return to stage two, depending on the patient's treatment. At this stage, the patient's viral load is extremely high, therefore weakening the patient's immune system to the point where they may develop opportunistic infections. Video three will go into these opportunistic infections in more detail, but just to name a few off the bat, um, some examples are pneumocystis pneumonia, mycobacterium avium complex, cryptococcal meningitis, and Kaposi sarcoma, just to name a few. And we will discuss these more in a later video. If these opportunistic infections progress, then the patient can pass away. There are several ways to test for HIV. Uh, The confirmatory tests used are the ELISA, Western blot, and PCR tests. These tests determine if the specimen sample has antibodies or antigens. Remember, antibodies show up in the person's body once the body detects the virus and creates that immune response. An antigen is the foreign substance or toxin itself that causes the immune response. ELISA tests, or enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays, are used for testing for HIV antibodies from blood, urine, and plasma-like fluid from the oral cavity, usually uh, retrieved by soaking up oral fluid from the cheeks. So not a saliva sample, but some plasma fluid from the cheeks of the mouth. Western blot tests detect antibody reactivity to specific combinations of HIV antigens. So these antigen combinations can be GP120-160 plus either P24 or GP41. And these antigens are uh, something we'll discuss a little later as well when we're talking about the life cycle of HIV. Polymerase chain reaction tests, also known as PCR tests, amplify the plasma HIV RNA to a level detectable and measurable with laboratory equipment. And this can determine a measurable viral load. Rapid tests, on the other hand, so like an at-home HIV oral swab, they're used to detect antibodies to HIV and can be used by anyone in their home or in a doctor's office. However, they must be followed by a confirmatory test. Now let's talk about the HIV life cycle. So stages from exposure to infection. HIV is a retrovirus. 
Retroviruses use RNA as their genetic material, and they insert copies of their own DNA genome into the DNA of a host cell, therefore changing the genetic makeup of that host cell. The outer surface of the HIV cell structure is called the HIV envelope. Embedded in this envelope are protein spikes called HIV glycoproteins. In the center of that HIV cell is the HIV capsid, which is the cell's core that contains two strands of HIV RNA. And reverse transcriptase, also known as P51, and protease, also known as P11, and finally integrase, also known as P32. So reverse transcriptase, protease, and integrase are all known as HIV enzymes. And HIV RNA is the genetic material of the virus. And then the enzymes are the proteins that help carry out the steps in the HIV life cycle. The life cycle of the virus is complex, but it can be broken up into three phases. So the first phase is binding and fusion. The second phase involves reverse transcription, integration, and replication. And then finally, the life cycle is complete with assembly and budding. It's important to know the life cycle of the virus because then you'll be able to understand when we talk about HIV medications and how they stop the virus from replicating and at which points in the life cycle it stops the virus. And it's also helpful because it helps you understand why we don't just use one class of medication, why we need different classes of the medications to stop HIV at different points in the life cycle. So we're going to go step by step, starting with binding. So the first step of the HIV life cycle is binding. HIV first binds to receptors on a CD4 cell. Now let's back up a moment and review what type of cell a CD4 cell is because you're going to be hearing that term a lot. A CD4 cell is a type of lymphocyte or immune cell that assists in activating the immune response when it detects a toxin. It helps coordinate the macrophages, B lymphocytes, and CDA lymphocytes, and cells like that to fight the infections. However, when HIV attacks CD4 cells, this depletes the number of CD4 cells available in the body to activate the immune response, therefore putting that person at greater risk for infections, like opportunistic infections. So bringing it back to that first step of the HIV infection, binding occurs when viral GP120, one of those glycoproteins found in the HIV envelope, attaches itself to the CD4 cell surface. Now following binding, we get to step two, fusion. So now the HIV envelope and CD4 membrane fuse, allowing HIV to enter that CD4 cell. It does this by using both the CD4 receptor and the chemokine receptors CCR5 and CXR4 to gain entry into the cell. Chemokine receptors are simply another type of receptor on the surface of some immune cells. GP120 essentially knocks on the door of that CD4 cell and its inhabitants, CD4 receptors, CCR5 and CXR4, they open the door and they let it inside and that's fusion. Now we're moving on to the second phase of the life cycle, reverse transcription. So once HIV is inside that CD4 cell, it releases and uses reverse transcriptase, which as we said before, is one of those enzymes that HIV has and it uses it to convert its own genetic material, so HIV RNA, into HIV DNA. And then this allows HIV to enter the CD4 cell's nucleus, where genetic material is located, and combine with that cell's genetic material. So if you think of HIV as this hooded figure, it's it's knocked on the door. In this phase of reverse transcription, it rips off its coat and lets all its RNA and enzymes run loose through the house. That brings us to the next step. So now, while inside the CD4 cell's nucleus, HIV is releasing integrase, which is another HIV enzyme. HIV uses integrase to insert its viral DNA into the DNA of the CD4 cell. Once that viral DNA is integrated into the CD4 cell's nucleus, this is called the provirus. Moving on to the next step, replication. 
Once all of this is integrated, HIV uses the machinery of the CD4 cell itself to make long chains of these HIV proteins. And these protein chains are then used as the building blocks for making more and more HIV. Finally, we get to the last phase of the entire process. So we're looking at assembly. New HIV proteins and HIV RNA move to the surface of the cell during assembly, and they assemble or line up and combine into these immature HIV. And this immature HIV is not infectious. So that's assembly. And then we move to the very final stage, budding. Finally, newly formed non-infectious HIV called the virion core pushes itself or buds out of the CD4 cell and the new HIV then releases protease, which is one of those HIV enzymes. And protease breaks up the long protein chains in the non-infectious virus creating mature infectious virus. And as the virion core pushes itself out, it actually takes a portion of the host cell's membrane and uses that as its own envelope. So now you have the foundational knowledge of HIV from a cellular level. Check out the next video in this series where we'll be talking about different medications used to treat HIV and where in the virus's life cycle they intercept. Thank you for watching.